Make a fan of me, I be a commando I no go play with your cry, baby yeah. Beauty, they drive me insane No, they drive me crazy One, two, three, make me pull up the gun now All the way away Me new Barati, so yeah, yeah, yeah Make a fan of me, I be a commando I no go play with your cry, baby Beauty, they drive me insane No, they drive me crazy one, two, three, make we pull up the gun now, all the way away. Me new barat is so, oh, yeah. Come walk with me, my baby. Hey, my baby. Come walk with me, my lady. Hey. Hello, and welcome to episode 19 of Africanists Assemble. This month, we decided to ask our contributors to reflect on the nature and definition of literature which by now is loaded with all kinds of assumptions and connotations. Here's the question we pose to them. In what ways do you think African literatures can help us to redefine the term literature as it's been used in the past? Let's hear what they thought of that. One of the ways I think African literature can help us to redefine the term literature as it's been used in the past is the recognition of its prominent future orality unlike the european literature that um, places premium on the idea of literacy and written tradition african literature which has its roots in oral tradition such as folk tales riddles proverbs, songs, chants, and the like, was in the past basically oral, meaning the tradition was primarily spoken or told and um, heard by the listeners or local audience before it eventually appeared in writing, which came as a result of missionary activities in Africa particularly West Africa. In the African past, the creator or transmitter of oral forms played a significant role in performing the unwritten literary piece. And in this sense, performance is another way African literature can help us redefine the term literature. Ruth Finnegan, a leading authority in African oral literature, aptly notes in a well in a well-known um, text titled Oral Literature in Africa that oral forms in their local settings are actualized in and through their performance, stressing that their continued existence from one generation to another is hinged on repeated performances. She furthers that the performances are dependent on the performer who either as a singer or speaker lends the unwritten literary piece as a continued or independent existence. And this is similar to the written literature whereby a literary work can be said to have an independent, tangible ex existence in even one copy as asserted by Ruth Finnegan. Therefore, from the aforementioned, the definition of the term literature, which chiefly refers to written works, can be altered or expanded to reflect the oral nature of literature as well. In other words, Literature should be expanded to incorporate carefully or creatively constructed verbal expressions and or carefully or creatively structured verbal expressions that convey a facet of human experience, either through songs or stories and other scenes that could be heard or listen to song or told without any medium or intervention of writing or reading of scene. 
I think study of African literatures unsettles, enriches, and transforms our ideas of key concepts in literary studies. Recently, when I was talking with the extraordinary Swahili poet and language expert Abdilatif Abdallah, he reminded me how the word in Swahili for the English literature was in flux as recently as the 1970s, when the word adabu was used to translate literature, and how the word I learned in the 1990s for literature, fasihi, in, in my Swahili class, was settled on only after that years-long debate in the Swahili phone world. I love the dynamism implied in that debate and the reminder that different languages and cultures form a sense of what we are calling literature in different ways, from their own conceptual and linguistic fields and worlds of experience and history, so that the very thought of literature is really a somewhat different thought from language to language. Or take again the notion of translation in Swahili, tafsiri, that is linked in Swahili in that very word to interpretation. There is a sense in the Swahili tafsiri of translations being inextricably bound with interpretation. And this is quite different from the idea and, and often ideal of translation that one encounters in Anglo-European discourse, of translation as transparent, a sort of glass vessel you use to transport words from one language into another without conceptually touching them. In the Swahili word, the mind of the reading translator is already there, processing and interpreting, reckoning really. Alamin Mazrui is one scholar who writes in insightful ways about philosophical difference between Swahili and Anglo-European cultures of translation. One of my favorite parts of studying Swahili literature is how that study can transform ideas of genre at work in Anglophone literary studies. I think about the genre of utumbuizo in Swahili, which has often been translated as lullaby in English, but is really something else again, and for which the English word song is also not quite adequate. And then there is a genre like gungu in Swahili, for which we don't have an easy equivalent in English and where, in trying to elucidate it for an English audience, you start asking yourself about many aspects of genre division in English, thinking about the gaps there, interrogating the language we use to describe genres, the very idea of genre itself. And this questioning is remarkably meaningful. Even though there is no reliable universal definition of the term literature, there seems to be some common assumptions on what the term entails. These basic assumptions seem to foreground the expectations of what is literary, mostly from the lens of a particular culture or tradition. They deface differences, invent otherness, and foreground a homogenizing principle. However, there is need for a more inclusive definition of the term. In my cultural background, Hausa, for instance, literature is understood to be a preserve of the eloquent who have special talents to write and to speak prophetically, eloquently, a general or universal truth about human nature. The modern idea of literature, mostly informed by the postmodernist relegation of meaning to the background, has made it possible for the emergence of literature for its own sake. However, I want to see a definition of literature that teases out meaning in everything considered literary. Literature in this way becomes primarily functional, serving some moral, philosophical, or political purposes beyond a pastime, beyond a pastime endeavor. In addition, I want to see a more inclusive and robust definition of literature that expands the concept to include those artistic, philosophical, and even political creative endeavors. Here, other objects of study that have potential to produce meaning or meanings should be included into the literary study proper. I want to see the adaptation of political cartoons, political speeches, religious sermons, most of dressing, cityscapes, etc. into the realm of literary study proper. Most of these fields have been considered and located in linguistics and other fields. I believe that my proposal will make the field more robust, more inclusive, and more ambitious.
Thank you very much. As we all know, literature is the universe of imagination. It is that world in which what is, is made out in such beautiful ways with language. And the African literatures, by the plurality, tells us one thing, that it is not just the written form alone that is literature, that oracle, the oral literature, is also a part of the definition of what literature should be. Literature should be the voice and the identity of a people, their story, and how they intend to pass along to the coming generation how they visualize the world, how they think of the world. As um, Ben Okri would say, to poison a people, poison their stories. And one of the things that African literature has done is that it has put in the service of social development and cognitive development of a people different ways of telling stories. Chino Achebe started a story from, from the end and finally revealed what had happened. And there are various ways in which African writers have redefined what literature is. They have brought in proverbs, which are encaps encapsulated knowledge in a way that increases and flavors the sense-making in the world. I see in a, in a lot of ways in which African storytelling mode even in the written form, has added to the armory of world literature. We have, in many ways, tried different experiments and different ways of telling our story. Literature should not just be one form, and it should not just be that only the gatekeepers will determine what literature is. As Africans from Cape to Cairo, we have managed to introduce new ideas into storytelling. The study of narration, the narrative pace, the narrative arc. And we've also ruptured this idea that every story must have a beginning, a middle, and an end. There are times when in the African worldview, a story has no end. And everybody who comes in is a participant in the story unless when it is written. And when it is also written, there are gaps that are left for the readers to fill, so that they're not left thinking that it's just the writer alone that has the, the authority over what is written. So that's my view of how um, African literature has helped to define the term literature as it has been used in the past. No. Katika wamu hii tutaangazia mchango fasihi za Kiafrika katika kupambanua upya dhana ya fasihi kama ilivyo kuwa zamani. Tunapozungumzia fasihi za Kiafrika tunaashiria fasihi ambazo zinawasilishwa kwa lugha mbalimbali za Kiafrika. Zikizungumzia masuala ya Uafrika, Mwafrika na utamaduni wake. Hata hivyo tunapaswa kutambua ya kwamba swala la lugha za Kiafrika ni swala lenye utata. Kuna wengine ambao wanahisi ya kwamba baadhi ya lugha za kigeni kama vile Kiingereza, Kijerumani, Kifaransa na kadhalika vile vile ni lugha za Kiafrika. Lakini hiyo ni simulizi ya siku nyingine. Fasihi za Kiafrika ghalabu huwasilishwa kwa lugha tofauti tofauti za Kiafrika kuhusu matukio na historia ya jamii. Kwa hivyo kimsingi tunachorejelea hapa ni simulizi ambazo huwasilishwa kwa njia ya mdomo na utendaji zikiakisi tajriba na matukio mbalimbali mbali ya kijamii. Fasihi hizi zinajumuisha utambaji hadithi zikiwemo hadithi za kubuni na hadithi za kihistoria. Ambapo msanii au fanani anaweza kuwa alizibuni hadithi hizo yeye mwenyewe au alizisikia katika jamii ama alipokezwa kutoka kwa vizazi vya awali. Masimulizi haya yanaakisi historia, matukio na maendeleo ya kijamii tangu enzi za ujima enzi za biashara ya utumwa vipindi mbalimbali mbali, vya ukoloni na ukoloni mamboleo, hadi nyakati za sasa katika kipindi hiki cha utandawazi fasihi za Kiafrika zimeweza kubashiri matukio mbalimbali ya kijamii na kiteknolojia zimeweza kutoa ushauri mafunzo pamoja na maadili ali mradi ni sehemu muhimu ya maisha ya jamii 
Fasihi hizi zinajumuisha uwasilishaji wa kishairi kama vile majigambo ambayo ni mashairi ya kuwasifia mashujaa wanapotoka vitani hasa baada ya kupata ushindi. Ile vile zinajumuisha masimulizi ya visakale, visasili, utendaji wa kisanaa katika tendi, matambiko, sheria sherehe za matanga, sherehe za jando na unyago na vile vile sherehe za harusi. Katika mawasilisho hayo ngoma na nyimbo huta malaki. Vipengele hivyo vya kimasimulizi na utendaji ndivyo vimekuwa chemichemi muhimu ya fasihi andishi. Kwa hivyo katika kuifafanua upya dhana ya fasihi kwa kuzingatia mielekeo na mitazamo ya fasihi za Kiafrika ni muhimu kuzingatia masimulizi kwa njia ya mdomo pamoja na utendaji katika tanzu zake mbalimbali na vile vile kujumuisha magani ya kishairi pamoja na nyimbo na ngoma Whenever the term literature is being mentioned the first thing that comes to one's mind is written story books or novels but literature in Africa is primarily oral in nature it is informative and participatory mainly it is a performance as a performance there is contact between the performer and the audience the effect of the performance is being felt by the performer and his or her audience the performer gets to read himself from the audience when the performer knows he bores his audience he begins or she begins to infuse riddles songs and dances to enhance his or her performance an excited audience will make the performance a spontaneous one when an african performance for example stories or narrative is being written down you would find out that the performance aspect will then be stunted but other aspects of the writing will be visible as chumwezu has defined african literature or written literatures as that which are done for the african audiences by african in african languages in reference to african languages transliterations into english is mostly a difficult part to do but most african literatures written literatures are adaptations or have their antecedents in oral literature for the past 2000 years starting from say plato or aristotle down to us today there has been different definitions of literature but of all these variegated definitions what is consistent in their in them is that literature is judged to be a written object which carries a people's hopes or fears and requires a social group of assumptions to make sense of it these have been on these definitions and the elements the components of these definitions western definitions of literature have been on and were later transplanted on the african intellectual space at the advent of colonialism until 50 years ago when research into traditional african literature began to wear this item that has been defined solely without taking into cognizance the african object of literature into context so starting with uh, Ruth Finnegan's works and many other researches carried out by Africans the western definition of literature began to expand to not just be that which is written but also many other components which we will refer to as performance orality and the instance of narration so with these three elements just mentioned we discover that what Aristotle defines as an art that is considered by language alone requires some kind of updating and it is that for us in Africa literature is that artistic object that is considered by language oral or written performance and by sundry elements arising from the context of the emergence of the literary object the literary being thank you The study of African language literature can provincialize Western literature. What does that mean? 
it invites us to question our often Western-centered notion of what literature is. To be more specific, a Western notion of literature of the last 200 years, which stressed writtenness, the genius author to the expense of popular forms of literature and folklore, and also academically separated the two. It means not to take a European canon of literature, its typical reliance um, on monolingualism as the norm of literary expression, but rather to consider it as a very particular case in comparison to most of humankind's literary history and also in comparison to other regions of the world, like Africa. Once we start asking what people consider as verbal art in their context, rather than imposing a ready-made notion of literature, our perspective becomes much broader and open. We have to ask anew, what is literature? If anything characterizes African literary landscapes, it is the coexistence of a large number of languages, but also genres and dynamic media. Not only the novel written in Hausa, Yoruba, Swahili or English, but also oral traditions are very much alive, like for instance Yoruba praise poetry or Riki, or the Islamiwa Koki in Hausa in northern Nigeria. As the very world, world literature contains the word letter, some scholars, I mean in its very root there is the word letter, in the literatura, some scholars, like for instance the Ugandan scholar Austin Bukenya, um, prefers the term orager when he speaks of oral literature to highlight its form, namely verbal expression. Literature in African languages draws our attention to the huge variety of verbal art in general, which then can be both oral and written. Writing is then not a precondition for verbal creativity, And it also did not arrive with the colonizer, as many people think. There are a number of writing traditions in Africa, as for instance the Tifinach used by the Tuareg, Amharic script and Arabic script, which has also been used to, to write a large variety of African languages, like, um, like for instance Hausa, Swahili, um, partly Afrikaans, um, but also Wolof in Senegal. And there is a huge manuscript tradition and literature tradition as well. African literature asks us to consider, does literature need to be an autonomous text different or from, let's say, music, for instance? While the Nobel Prize awarded to Bob Dylan finally challenged the world and made it reflect about lyrics as poetry, well, lots of African oral literature, which can include dance, drums and other instruments, has been doing this for a long time, well, challenging us to really think again what is literature and can poetry not also include music. It is just that in Europe, well, since the age of enlightenment, this connection of performance, music and literature has given way to an emphasis on decentralized forms of writing. The physical performance, the event, the festival type of literature was just less important than the abstract meaning of the word and the text. However, recently it has also experienced a reconsideration in the West. So for instance, think about that through Afri Afro-American rap, hip hop and slam poetry, performative word art is making a comeback also in Europe. And as well, it feeds back into African context. So hip hop, like all African American music styles, borrows from African traditions, but has also returned to Africa. And also spoken word is very much thriving in, for instance, Nairobi, Lagos and Dar es Salaam, often creating a bridge between older oral genres and new poetic features and also making itself, um, extending itself variably into the World Wide Web, into all kinds of social media. Finally, African literature also prompts us to ask if literature is not autonomous, how does it intersect with social institutions and realities? In many contexts, like for instance the Easy Bongo praise poetry in South Africa, most people have, would have a hard time to consider it as literature only in the sense of a mere art practice, since it has fundamental political and so socio-regulative relevance. In other words, in Zulu society, as Kunene says, where poetry is almost as common as ordinary speech, Easy Bongo typically takes the form of a series of praise names and is central to political discourse, negotiating power, allowing for moments of critique and irony as well. In many contexts, thus, you would not even have a name for literature, I mean, as an abstract term, 
which only came later, mostly um, introduced through school curricula. But there is a large variety of particular poetic practices held in high esteem, not only for their beauty, but also for their central cultural importance in keeping the social and often also the metaphysical world in balance, negotiating power, paying worship to gods or respect to ancestors, accompanying rites of passage and imagining community. Thus, in a nutshell, African literature invites us to question the very concept of literature, or rather ask us again and again what it is. So first of all, I wasn't a literature student that I could have a deeper knowledge about the terms that were used to describe the word literature in itself. But from what I know, at least the shallow information I have about uh, the, how literature has been defined. I know that it's mostly classified under fiction and under imagination. That's exactly how I uh, I understand or how I see that literature has been seen or defined by many literature scholars. On the other hand, when I look at African literature, I have the impression that uh, Maybe because I have a connection to African literature. Maybe because I relate so much to the story when it's been put out there in such a way that I fail to see it as fiction or as imagination. If I look, for example, Purple High Discus by Chiamanda Gonzi, I see myself in a society like that. That's something that happened in Nigeria. But I see myself so much in it. That is just one out of many other African literature. What are written in Kenya, what are written in Uganda, in Ethiopia, wherever. And me being a Cameroonian, and I can still highly relate to it. So because of this, I have the impression that African literature could not fall under the definition of fiction and imagination as much as uh, the general term or literature generally is being seen by many. I think it's an expression of reality, an expression of individuals' uh, daily life in such a way that it could barely be considered fiction or imagination in my opinion. In that sense, I think like if uh, people look at literature in general, the way they see the African literature, and then we get to learn to respect the information, respect the story that is being told even in general literature, such that we get to understand that if African literature could be so much reality, then any other literature that is being put out there it's just put out there because it doesn't just come from space, but because it comes from people's experiences all over the world. African literature has four epochs. A. Pre-slavery and colonialism. B. Slavery and colonialism. C. Post-slavery and colonialism and D, new slavery and colonialism. These various epochs produced four different literature about Africa. Therefore, African literature in this sense constitutes the hypopoetic. But before the experience that he formed, the African histopoetic literature was the era of memorial symbolic literature. This was the era of proverbs, storytelling, symbolic representation in drawings, paintings, and carvings. The summary of African histopoetic and memorial symbolic literature gave birth to humane literature. This implies the human and inhuman experiences of Africans. Therefore, one of the ways African literature can help us to redefine the term literature as it has been used in the past is to include in it 
the memoir symbolic and historic poetics of Africans and African descents. The memoir symbolic and historic poetic of Africa is the real literature because it is an emotional fluidity that streams into literary forms to ignite other persons' emotions in written and oral form as a result of human and influenced in human experiences of Africans. Those were all the contributions we received this month. What do you think of their answers? Can you think of other ways that African literatures challenge, alter, or expand on the term literature? Tell us in the comments below. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Africanists Assemble. This is the last episode of season two, but we will be back in February with the first episode of season three. See you then. We should meet ya, hey, I won't want Come yeah. walk with me, my baby Hey, my baby Come walk with me, my lady Hey, oh, die away Come walk with me, my baby Hey, yeah, yeah, my baby Come walk with me, my lady Hey, oh, die away I love you with all my heart, oh Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah.